Well, I know that all of you know in two months we're going to be observing the spring holy days. And we need to look toward that and I want to mention something today that I hope will be a good reminder for us uh, because uh, that will be here before we know it. You know, we don't know if we're going to have any bad weather or any more storms between now and then. We hope we'll be able to easily meet together every week. Uh, but it won't be long. And the Passover, uh, the Days of Unleavened Bread will be here. And of course, as we prepare to be a part of that, we often focus on examining ourselves because that's what we're told to do. Uh, we're told to consider how well we're doing, consider how much we're growing, uh, examine ourselves and then observe the Passover, take the bread, take the wine because it is very, very important. But apart from the idea of examining ourselves, I want to focus on this spring holy day season that we know will be here in a couple of months. I want to focus on it being uh, the season of forgiveness. The season of forgiveness. Our Heavenly Father is the author. He's the source of forgiveness. And He is the one who extends forgiveness to us as His children. Uh, he does that because He loves us. And He wants us to benefit from His love, benefit from His forgiveness. I want us to look in Psalm 103 to begin with. Psalm chapter 103 has several very clear verses that are about how, how God views us. Uh, he knows, even as we talked about Elijah, having some ups, but then having some downs, being frustrated, not even wanting to live. That, that's pretty discouraged. And yet, see, God is able to redeem Elijah. He could encourage him. He could help him out. He could give him a reminder of, there's a purpose why I'm dealing with you, and I want you to keep that in mind. But here in Psalm 103, we see in verse 8, Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in steadfast love. And then down in verse 10, He does not deal with us according to our sins. Nor does He repay us according to our iniquity. But in verse 11, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His loving kindness toward those who fear Him. Verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, as far so far He removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for all those who fear him. And in verse 14, he knows how we were made. He's the one who created us with the physical form, shape, image that we have and the limitations that we have. He knows how we were made and he remembers that we are but dust. He remembers that we're just human. Now you can read that and of course verse, uh, what is it about verse 12, how far is the east from the west? That's, you know, that's indescribable. That, that can't be comprehended because eventually you'll go around the world and run into each other if you did that. But it's, it's pointing out that there's not a limit. There's not a limit to the forgiveness of God. Actually, as you read these verses, I'd like for us to be reminded 
What it does describe is the extent. The extent of God's mercy toward us. It just says it's unlimited. It also describes God's character and God's nature. And it describes the heart of God. That's what he is. That's what he does. He is merciful. He is, you know, whenever you read about Jesus being full of grace and truth, we also know that, well, the Father is also full of grace and truth. They have those same qualities. And so when we pray about the Father being full of grace and truth and love and mercy, we need to realize that, well, those are characteristics of God uh, that he extends to us, but that he wants us to actually grow in. Because as his kids, as his children, he wants us to grow to be like him. We turn over to Psalm 130. Psalm 130 says in verse 1, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Hear my voice, let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you, in verse 3, if you, O Lord, should mark, or if you were putting check marks against us, if you would mark iniquity, Lord, who would stand? You know, thankfully God has a big eraser. He takes care of it. He erases our iniquities and our sins. If you, O Lord, would mark iniquity, uh, who could stand? But in verse 4, there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. You may be honored by all of us. Thankfully, you know, we don't see God as a cruel, angry, disappointing parent or a disappointed parent. That isn't the way God reveals himself. Now, he does anticipate that we'll learn and try to obey, that we will be driven by the obedience of faith. And he wants to bless us with that. But here it says that his forgiveness is, is available and he should be respected. He should be revered because of that. Now, we all know in Exodus as the Israelites were coming out of Egypt, you know, God showed them that it would be the blood of the Passover lamb that would spare them. Uh, that's what the blood of the lamb pictured. It was marked on the doorpost and they were protected. They were forgiven or preserved. I guess uh, I, I will go on to being forgiven, but at that point uh, they were saved. They were preserved and ultimately would be coming out of Egypt. But I want to go on to what it says here in 1 Peter because in 1 Peter, you know, the blood of the Lamb is clearly described as the blood of Jesus Christ connected to us. In verse 17 of 1 Peter 1, verse 17 First Peter 1, it says, If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, then live in reverent fear before the time of your exile, during the time of our lives. We need to respect. Respect what God has done for us. Respect how he has called us. Respect how he is preparing us for the kingdom of God, that he is preparing us by causing us to grow in his divine nature. He says in verse 18, you know that you were rescued, you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors. You were ransomed not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined. Verse 20 says he was destined, talking about the blood of the Lamb, 
the Lamb of God, who would shed His blood for us, He was destined before the foundation of the world. But it was revealed at the end of the age for your sake. See, now how long has the Father and the Word been preparing for what He would do in sending Jesus to the earth 2,000 years ago? For Him to go through what He did. For Him to give His life. For Him to lay down His life in death so that we could be covered by the blood of the Lamb. They've been preparing that for a long time. It says, through him, in verse 21, you have come to trust in God who raised him from the dead, who gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. And so we have that great blessing. Verse 22, now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. And so here Peter is appealing to the brethren that he would write to and to all of us as members of the church of God today. You know, we want to have a love for one another and that needs to be from the heart. You have, in verse 23, been born anew. You've been born from above. Not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. See, God has begun the process of uh, being born from above in our lives. It's important for us to always be mindful of that. You know, that was something in a sense that God kind of reminded Elijah of. You know, you've been doing the work that I gave you to do, and I don't want you to forget who's really in charge of that. And that, of course, is what we want to remember as well. Some of you have endured lengthy sickness. That didn't change anything about God and His involvement with you or His help that He provided. Uh, that's something that you know, we all have to be continually reminded of. But God extends forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. And He laid down His life for us. Now we all know of the perfect example that Jesus set. Whenever he was, and we read this in Luke 23, verse 34, we see that as Jesus was brutally being murdered and crucified, he said a number of things, some of them kind of short, but in Luke 23, verse 34, he says, let me turn back there and read it, Luke 23, Verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. You know, that, that we know was reflecting the nature of God. That was reflecting the way that the Son of God always lived. He was always willing to forgive. He would point out some things that were wrong, whether to the Pharisees or to, to uh, those who were in the temple uh, robbing people of the, sac the sacrifices they were selling or manipulating. And, and he threw them out of the temple, yes. But he also had an, a heart that would be concerned enough about them to forgive them doesn't directly say that, but that's clearly what he was able to do. And we see in, in Stephen's example in Acts 7, you know, he was being put to death. He was going to be stoned. And he said, don't lay this to their charge. Those were great examples, and there are many examples that uh, perhaps we could look at. Those ones stand out about being forgiving even under a very difficult circumstance. But in connection with thinking about this upcoming holy days, these spring holy days, thinking about them as a season of forgiveness, how does that directly affect us? Well, in Matthew 6, we see in the, in the model prayer, 
what Jesus taught his disciples to, to pray about, things to pray about. And in verse 12, the middle part of this model prayer, he says, forgive us our sins, our debts, as we also have forgiven those who trespass against us. See, that's a part of what he tells us. He, Jesus told the disciples, he tells all of us to pray, to be forgiven of our sins, but to also extend that same forgiveness uh, to others, to others who may irritate us, who may op oppose anything that's regarding God. He tells us to have a forgiving heart, a forgiving attitude. And actually, I just focus on this one part out of this model prayer. He backs this up in verse 14. Because he says, if you forgive others their trespasses, then your Father, your Heavenly Father, will also forgive you. But then it seems to give somewhat of a warning. If we don't forgive others, then neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Verse 15 is, is pretty powerful. It's powerful in that you know, we need uh, to heed that warning. And so I ask, do we have, do you have a heart of forgiveness? Like Jesus clearly did, like Stephen represented in what he had to say, knowing that his life was coming to an end. Do you have a heart of forgiveness. You know, we know we want to be forgiven, but how quickly do we forgive others? How quickly do we forgive and express love toward others whenever there's some kind of a disagreement or difficulty? And this can happen in our homes. It can happen in our marriages. It can happen among brethren. It can happen in interacting with others. Why are we not quick to forgive? Why is it that our nature is almost defensive about forgiving? Well, the fact is, you know, we all always want to be right. We always want to be right. And a lot of times we're not. A lot of times we need to be reconciliatory. We need to have or grow in the nature that God wants us to grow in. See, what keeps us from being forgiving? Why? Why would we not want to be forgiven? Knowing what it says, knowing in verse 15 of Matthew 6, if we don't forgive, have a forgiving heart, well then God that puts a limit on what God will extend to us. And so we've got to be growing in the heart of forgiveness. See, so what keeps us from forgiving? What keeps us from holding grudges? Do any of us hold grudges? Again, we have to think about it. We have to ask ourselves, do we hold grudges? Do we have hurts that are unresolved, perhaps even hidden? and unaddressed hurts that we ought to be resolving. And then I ask the question, is hard-hearted is hard -hearted anger a part of not being forgiving? I hope to show you that there's a connection. There's a connection there. Is hard-hearted anger a part of not being forgiving. Well, I'm only going to go to two different sections here today and hope I can go through those quickly. But I want us to think about, as we look toward a season of forgiving, uh, how it is that I look at my heart of forgiving. Matthew 18, uh, we often go to regarding different uh, examples and illustrations that we, we find here in Matthew 18, most of them in the early part of the chapter. 
But I want to drop down to the end because what we see in Matthew 18 is that it describes the extent of God's forgiveness. Now we've already seen it in Psalms. We see that there isn't a limit to God's forgiveness. He's always able and willing to forgive us when we come to Him and ask for forgiveness. But see, after discussing some things earlier here in the chapter, let's drop down to verse 21. And you see a question that Peter brought up after listening to what Jesus had to say. Actually, the section here right before this is, is resolving difficulties with someone who sins against you. Some member of the church that sins against you. And I guess Peter was probably thinking about, well, let's see, if we have to do that, how much do we have to do it? Because that's, that's what it appears his question indicates. In verse 21, Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member, a brother in the church sins against me, how often should I forgive him? Now, that's the way this particular translation phrases it. It almost seems to be implying, how many times do I have to forgive him? That's what it seems that Peter was saying. He goes on, how often do I have to forgive? As many as seven times? And what if somebody did something incredibly ridiculous and hurt me and there's a rift between us and even though it was three years ago, I still remember it. How many times do I have to forgive? And of course, Christ's answer in verse 22, Oh, Peter. Oh, Peter. Not just seven times, but 70 times seven. Pointing out a kind of a limitless number because you couldn't believe that somebody would offend us or hurt us with something that was said or something that was done that many times over and over again. And yet what Peter was really saying, how many times do I have to do that? And then, of course, you've got the parable and starts in verse 23. A parable that points out what the real problem is about forgiving or about not forgiving and about what's, what's really involved. Verse 23, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And when he couldn't pay that, the Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children, all his possessions, and make payment. You know, well, at that point, you know, they, they had a debtor's prison and so... You know, they could be sold into slavery. That was how it was that they were going to be trying to work off a debt. And yet this debt was, you know, he was never going to work long enough to ever pay it off. But he says in verse 26, So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. And of course, you know, this ruler knowing, uh, well, you're, you're never going to be able to pay this off. But he says in verse 27, out of pity for him, out of compassion for him, the Lord of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Incredible, incredible gift that he gave him. And in verse 28, I think all of us are familiar with what happened Apparently, this servant wasn't very appreciative for what just happened because in verse 28, his same servant, as he went out, came upon another fellow servant who owed him a hundred denarii, which was a very small amount, maybe a day's wage or something. And as he met this person, he seized him and said, pay me, grabbed him by the throat, choking him. Pay me what you owe me. The fellow servant fell down, pleaded with him, have patience and I'll pay you. But in verse 30, he refused 
And he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the whole debt. Now, when the fellow servants saw what was happening, they, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported this to the Lord, what had taken place. And the Lord summoned this servant and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. You asked me to forgive you. You said, forgive me, I'm, I'm not able to pay. I don't, I don't have any way to pay. I could never recover in that way. It says, I forgave you all the debt. And verse 33, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Should you not have had mercy? Should you not have been filled with a heart of forgiveness? You just experienced the greatest uh, release of your indebtedness to me. See, and all of us are indebted to God in our sins. You know, we're all guilty. We are guilty, and so, you know, we should learn from this lesson. And, of course, Jesus gave this somewhat lengthy parable about having a desire to follow the words of Jesus about if you don't forgive others, then how's God going to forgive you? He ends this up in verse 34, In anger the Lord handed him over to the tormentors till he could pay the entire debt. So, verse 35, My heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So it wasn't a matter of how many times did he See, that was Peter's question. How much do I have to forgive? That's not even the question. That's not even brought up here in answer. It's in answer. So you have to have a heart of forgiveness. See, now, it's important for us to think about whether this affects us. As we think about what God is making available to us here in a couple of months where we come before him, honor him, respect him, respect his son, thank him for the redeeming blood of the lamb. And then also go about uh, serving others uh, in a way that reflects a forgiving heart. Now the other scripture that I want to read through here is also one a chapter in Ephesians chapter 4 that we often read or go through and generally read the first part the first part of the chapter because it's about the church and it's about how the church needs to function and so we do go over that uh, somewhat regularly perhaps or maybe more regularly the unity that is to be in the body of Christ we often focus on that. But I want us to drop down to verse 17 because from verse 17 on down to the rest of the chapter uh, explains something about the heart of forgiveness. And it's important that we understand what God reveals here. Of course, Paul is writing this. He's teaching this to uh, the members of the church in Ephesus. You know, this was, you know, a solid church. It was a church that was quite well known. Uh, Paul was there. John later was there. Uh, a lot of people were uh, growing in that congregation. And yet he, he adds here in the end of this chapter, chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 17, now this I attest and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of your mind. And so here he was talking about how just living in this world, because that the Gentiles were not schooled in the law. They needed to actually learn something about the law. That was a part of what Paul needed to teach. And yet he says the nations... The people outside of the house of Judah are in many ways ignorant of what God even says. 
But he goes ahead in describing that futility in their mind. In verse 18, they are simply living in darkness. They are darkened. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance. So, you know, until they learn, until we know, and even all of us are going to be teaching the law. That's what we're going to eventually do in the world tomorrow. The kingdom of God is going to be based on everybody learning the law of God, learning the Bible, learning what we study every week, learning how it is that we follow God's way of life. But here he says the Gentiles, people who follow the way of the world, you know, they are simply in a deceived and darkened condition because they're ignorant. They don't know. And because of the hardness of their heart. You know, this is describing the human condition, condition that's, that affects everybody. He's directing it right at the Gentiles who didn't know the law even. But he says humanly and with human nature as it is, hardness of heart demanding my own way, wanting to demand my own way. And none of us can say that that hadn't happened at least once or twice in our lives. You know, it maybe happened quite often, probably with me, happened today. You know, that's, that's very, very likely. But he says, these people who are unaware of what God is doing have a hardness of heart. Verse 19, they have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness and greed and impurity. You know, Paul was clearly describing what people needed to know about uh, what's a common human heart like. And there are other verses that we could read about this, but he says that's not the way you learn Christ. You know, what you learned about Christ is completely different than that. You're aware of the law. You're aware of your obligation to God. You don't want to have a hard-hearted, highly opinionated, glaring miss or lack of sensitivity in your heart. And then he, he mentions several things here. That this, this seemed, I don't know that I've focused on this before, but I marked it anyway. In the rest of the chapter, he makes some contrast. Some contrast between, as Christians, you don't want to be like the world, being hard-hearted, being insensitive, being obnoxious. You need a heart that's different than that, and he's going to tell you how to get it. But he says in verse 22, you've been taught to put away your former way of life, your old self. And in verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, we all have access to the spirit of the holy God. He's given it to us. He's granted us the blessing of being begotten, a good work that he started in our lives. Allow that to renew your mind. Put away your former way of life, your old self that is corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And clothe yourself with a new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So here he makes a contrast. Well, if you're going to be an active and growing Christian, well, then you're going to come to understand that there's something about my heart that needs to be worked on. Something that he calls uh, a heart of forgiveness. Now, he makes that first contrast. Put away the old self. Embrace. Be renewed. Grow in your new life. Then he goes ahead in verse 25. Also, put away something else. 
Put away lying. Put away lying. Let everyone speak the truth to their neighbor, for we are members of one another. And so here he points out something else to put away. Put away your old self. Embrace a new life. Put away uh, lying. Now, I'm pretty sure we could take a poll. All of us would say that lying is wrong. You know, we know what the ninth commandment says. But see, why does Paul make a point about this? Because he's going to go ahead and describe things that people say that are not accurate, not correct. And of course he says, put away lying and speak the truth to your neighbor. Be truthful. And again, I think all of us want to be truthful, or at least for the most part we want to be truthful, but we tend to shade the truth according to something that benefits us sometimes. And he goes ahead to say, be angry but sin not. Don't make room for the devil. Thieves need to stop stealing. Let them labor and work honestly for their hands. Verse 29, let no evil talk come out of your mouth, only what is useful for building up as there is need, so your words may give grace to those who hear. So here he's describing a number of things uh, that they, we have to put away, we have to re remove ourselves from. And I'm sure all of you have noticed uh, the world is getting worse and worse and worse about what they enjoy saying because they say all kinds of wrong and ultimately terrible things that should never be said, but that's just kind of constantly fed to us all the time, and that can affect us too. Here he says, put away falsehood or lying. Think about what you're saying and be truthful. And so again, this is another good, a good thing to think about. In verse 30, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, which you have been marked with a seal for the day of redemption. See, now that's somewhat of an archaic way of saying. You know, actually stir up the gift of God in you instead of neglecting it. Instead of ignoring the fact that I need help from God. And that help often comes from the Holy Spirit if I seek it, if I ask for it, if I ask to do what it says. And then finally, in verse 32, or excuse me, verse 31, here it's going to tell us in verse 32 to be tender-hearted and forgiving. Tender-hearted and forgiving. That's what he says we should do. But what does he contrast that with in verse 31? In verse 31 he says, Put away from you all... Here he's going to describe a number of heart issues. Put away from you all bitterness. Bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with malice, all malice. Verse 32, be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, again as God in Christ has forgiven you. See, now here in this short section, you know, Paul has written, God is inspired to, to show us, well, you know, there are things that we need to move away from, things that we need to disregard or put away, and then things that we need to embrace. And embracing a tender heart and embracing forgiving one another are contrasted with bitterness and anger. Whether we know it or not, whether we believe it or not, whether we've even considered it or not, there may be things that we are angry about. Maybe angry with ourselves or angry with God or angry with somebody else, but that's preventing us from being forgiving 
from being truly tender-hearted, forgiving one another. I think verse 31 and 32 are just amazing because it describes the source of why and what we have to move away from in order to be pure, in order to be tender-hearted and forgiving and having that heart of forgiveness that God so wants us to have. See, so in essence, he's telling us that we have to replace our old ways with something new. He, re he contrasts the old self with the new self. How do you get rid of the old self? Well, it has to be replaced by the new self. Replaced by thinking a different way. Thinking of true righteousness and holiness. Growing in a likeness of God. See, that's why when we read through the, about the, the forgiveness of God, you know, we can see that, well, it's unlimited. It, it's available. It is love. It is love. That's what it is. But then when we read about you know, what the uh, old self is in contrast to the new self, well, maybe there's something we should think about. So he contrasts the old self with the new self. He contrasts lying with speaking the truth and having our words build up others. See, the way to get away from deception and lying is to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth so that you are uplifting toward others. And then finally, the way to be forgiving. The way to have the forgiveness of God, the forgiveness of the heart of forgiveness that he wants, the tender heart that he wants, is to put away bitterness and anger. Because there's, that's a root of what is manifest from not being forgiving. Or holding grudges. See, holding grudges is easy to do. And sometimes it even feels justified, and sometimes it feels uh, kind of good. That's... That's the way that, you know, you could say, you know, that'd be the way it is in general for everybody. And yet, I want to apply it to me. And you have to think about you. But in the contrast he makes, the old self has to be replaced by the new self. Lying and deception has to be replaced by speaking the truth and with grace. Bitterness and anger, how can that be replaced? Well, we have to be forgiving. And from what he started talking about earlier in verse 18 and 19, about a hard-hearted insensitivity, he says that just comes natural. That's just the way an inclination is for human nature. And so we can, we can say, okay, I read that and I, I know what I'm supposed to do, it has to be replaced with the tender-hearted desire to have the forgiveness that God has toward me for others. So, uh, those are the two sections of Scripture I wanted to cover. We might read just one other here in Colossians because it's somewhat of a summary of what we've read here. But the reason why I uh, reflect on this is because we can look at uh, the upcoming Holy Days. Uh, we can look at them in, in kind of a hard on ourselves, examining ourselves. Or we can look at it that, well, I want to grow in this season of forgiveness of having a forgiving heart. Having a tender heart. Being understanding. And of course, this is what it says here in Colossians 3. Paul goes through some, some similar things, probably subtitled in your Bible, or at least it is in mine, uh, a new life in Christ. You know, how do you do that? Well, then you've got a number of verses that bring that out. But what I want to point out in connection with what uh, I've been covering today 
is in verse 13. Colossians 3, 13. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Now that's, that's about as clear or plain as we can get. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. See, God wants us to have a tender-hearted heart of forgiveness. And so I think that it certainly is something to consider, something to seek according to what he describes here. He describes things that he knows are wrong with human beings. He was describing that and saying, well, contrast that with what the Spirit of God allows you to do. And so... Please consider, do I really have and should I seek a heart of forgiveness? And if we consider our ways, uh, we, can, we are going to be doing that between now and the holy days, we know. Uh, but I, I think it might be good for us to think about these upcoming holy days uh, as uh, a season of forgiveness because that clearly ties in with what Christ made available through the sacrifice of his own blood.